I'm going to tell you about my work. Essentially, it's about Black Genesis. It's a book I've published uh, with uh, Tom Brophy, a physicist who lives in San Diego. And uh, we got together a couple of years ago, and we decided to publish this book with this rather provocative title. And I'll tell you all about it. But I'll introduce the background to it. Because <clears throat> there's a gang of us. Uh, myself, uh, John West, you know John West? No? Oh, the, John West of the Sphinx. Uh, Robert Schock, they're the ones who made quite a stir about the age of the Sphinx in the early 1990s. Uh, Graham Hancock, oh, you all know Graham Hancock. Yeah. Yes, you all know Graham Hancock. Uh, Graham Hancock and I have written three books together and we're actually bringing another one out in a couple of weeks time so I may as well advertise it. It's called The Master Game. And it's a fun book, but I won't, I'll let you discover what it's all about. Uh, but, and I should add, uh, a very nice colleague of mine who is here today, Andy Collins, who has joined the, uh, the Pyramid Quest. We've all uh, started a rather big stir in the early 90s. Uh, where we challenged the established views about Egypt and more particularly about the origins of Egypt. We weren't the first ones to do this, of course, there have been others before us, but this kind of, uh, kind of stirred the pot. It shook the apple tree, like John West says. And the reason is, is that we got on television and we made a big, big, big splash. And BBC got involved, and NBC, and ABC, and Discovery Channel, you name it. They all loved this because it kind of provoked a situation. And the bottom line is that we were saying that ancient Egypt is probably much older than we think. Nothing more than that. But even that got the academic world very, very upset. And when I published my first book, The Orion Mystery, <laughs> it's rather weird when you publish something that uh, is original and kind of touches the vein. I knew it did because, boy, I had Egyptologists, I had archaeologists, I had philologists, I had everybody with an ist after his name <laughs> <laughs> trying to shoot me down. And if it was the 16th century, I would have been dragged in the street and probably burnt. Uh, but you couldn't do that. And so it went on for years, you know, and I've been called all sorts of things, you, some rather weird ones. Well, I mean, apart from charlatan and, and uh, madman and liar, and there was a few odd ones like uh, Zionist. <laughs> <laughs> that came from Mr. Hawass, Mr. Dr. Hawass, the, the ex, I'm very proud to say, Minister of Antiquities. <laughs> Mr. Hawass used to say, I remember at the beginning, uh, Robert Boval, who is he? Uh, he comes here, uh, he, that's his famous, he's Mr. Boval, Mr. Y, Mr. X, they come here at the pyramids, they make a theory, they go back home, they drink a bit of beer, and that's it. <laughs> and in two months, no, one month, they're gone with the wind. <laughs> that, that was 15 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> and. Uh, we're still, we're still here. Uh, I hope you have the pleasure of hearing Graham Hancock one of these days here, but our battle cry is when I ever call Graham Hancock, we say we're still here. <laughs> yeah, so another little parable I like to say is that things can change dramatically in your life. We are all prone and the opportunities are always there, even now, perhaps. You know, you take a left turn instead of a right turn. You go in one pub instead of another. You go in one shop. You take a holiday somewhere instead of another place, and things change. Uh, it's a life so full of opportunities. And <clears throat> one of the most dramatic change, and I call it the syndrome of the apple. 
You know the old story of Newton, the apple falls on his head and suddenly boing, he thinks. He asks the question. When there is something that is an anomaly, like crop circles, somebody says, uh, how do they do it? Well, he asked, uh, why does an apple fall? Now, it's amazing that for thousands of years before him, apples fell, uh, pears fell, plums fell, bricks fell, arrows fell, lots of things fell. But for some reason, nobody clicked to ask the question. But asking the question isn't enough, of course. He pursued it. And sometimes when you pursue something like this, it's very much against the odds because you're going to go against the established view. We know all these stories, Galileo and Copernicus and you name it. But somehow he did pursue it. And the reason we're here and I'm talking through a mic and we're going to the moon and soon to Mars is because he asked the question. It's quite amazing. One simple question. And it led to the discovery of gravity, laws of mechanics, and we may one day fly to the, to the stars. Well, we all have this precarious apple that hangs on our heads, this symbolic apple. Whatever your apple is, if it ever falls, pursue it. I'm serious. A lot of people say, well, we'll leave it to others. You know, if it's a scientific question, let the scientists work it out, and so forth. I gave a talk in London the other day on cosmology. And people say, okay, cosmology, but it's for the astrophysicists and the physicists, and they study the, the galaxies and the stars and the origins of the universe and so forth. No, cosmology is every single one of us. Every single one of us, including the Pope, and President Obama, and President Mubarak, have the fundamental questions that are cosmological. Where do we come from? Who are we? What are we? And where do we go once the body dies? The fundamental questions and that the answer of these questions or the pursuit of the question is cosmology. Some of our scientists are looking there and they send Hubble and they take pictures and I'm <clears throat> very privileged to know some of the cosmologists in this country. You have some very good ones, uh, Chandra Wickrama Singh at Cardiff and a variety of others. Uh, Maku Kaku Michu in the States. We had Carl Sagan, you remember Carl Sagan of Cosmos? Uh, Carl Sagan said something fantastic, he brought it down to one phrase, one statement to describe what we are. He said, we are star stuff. What amazing. We are star stuff. There's a star, some four, five, six billion years ago, somewhere out there in our galaxy that blew up. And it's part of its matter got captured by our star, which is the sun, formed the planets, and billions of years afterwards, here we are. We are star stuff, but I add just one more little word. We are star stuff, become conscious. What an amazing thing we are. That's each one of us. And it seems to me that the knowledge, the knowledge of everything, is not out there. It's in our own cosmos. We are made of the matter that the universe was created. It's in us. We tend to take things for granted. As I am wondering about here, I'm actually performing the laws of gravity.